We've been through Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 so far, and I pointed out to you a lot of different things. We talked about all kinds of cool stuff about the earth and what it looks like and how God has established it. We talked about the firmament a little bit. We talked about the deep. We talked about heaven, how heaven is a mountain, and what direction is heaven? North. 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 You can find heaven in the night sky any given night. You can tell somebody where it is. It's right over there. <laughs> Behind that north star, it is in the north, stretched out over the empty place, where God, uh, right where God put it. And that's where God is sitting on a throne right now. So if anybody asks you if you know where you're going when you die, you can go, yes, sir. Right over there. If I die, you better not say this. And uh, <laughs> what I wanted to give before we move on is a timeline because I gave you lots of information and I wanted to give you a picture of what I'm teaching you. There is a huge gap of time between Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2. And I don't know how long that gap of time is. It could be trillions of years, it could be six days, it could be two days, it could be 50 years. I don't know. Here's what I know. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's what God did in the beginning. <coughs> and then in verse 2, the earth shows up without form and void. <coughs> Something happened to the earth. Does anybody remember anything about what we talked about with what happened to the earth? The water above and below. That'll be in the future. That'll be after this. That's the firmament. We did talk about that. But what? why was the earth without form and void? Because um, the, the angels made God mad. Exactly. The angels made God mad. <laughs> the sons of God were, with, were created sometime around the beginning. The sons of God. Those are the angels. That is cherubs, angels, seraphim. That includes Lucifer were created before Genesis chapter 1 gets moving. And we showed you verses like in Jeremiah chapter 4, how that Satan was king over the sons of God on the earth. He was in Eden, the garden of God. He was the anointed cherub. Remember it said that they had cities. It said that there were birds, and it says there was no man. Is before any man was on this planet, there were angels, and Lucifer was the king over them, and he ruled in a place called Eden, and they did so wickedly. You say, how wickedly? They had slavery. They would buy and sell souls. They would murder. The Bible says he was a murderer from the beginning. You know what that tells me? From the beginning, Satan was a murderer. So there was murder going on before Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. There was hatred, there was lying, there was pride. Isaiah 14, we looked at that. Satan said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Turn there. I don't think we actually slowed down and looked at that one. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Here is a picture of Satan before Adam showed up. Satan was king on the earth. And this passage right here is uh, talking about him. Look at verse 12. <coughs> so you understand, Isaiah 14 is something that when Satan falls in the future, this is a proverb that people are going to say against him. When Satan falls in Revelation chapter 13... People are going to say this to Satan. Here's what they say. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, here is what Satan said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. So Satan was ruling as king on a throne on the earth. And he said, I will ascend into heaven. He got prideful. He started thinking, I'm better than God. 
I should be king in heaven too. I don't like just being king on the earth. I'll be king in heaven. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Here's the real dagger. I will be like the most high. Here's what happened to Satan. He got proud. He started thinking, I can do better than God. I will be like God. God gave him some rule, some authority, and what did he do? He abused it. He got prideful and disobeyed what he was supposed to be doing. What happens when God gives any man on the planet some authority? They disobey, they abuse the authority, and they rebel against what God told them to do. It's been happening since the beginning. So Satan rebels against God. What happens? God created a beautiful heaven and a beautiful earth. I can guarantee you that. I'll bet the heaven was immaculate like it is today. I'll bet the earth was the most beautiful thing you could ever imagine. Clean, no thorns, no chiggers, no <laughs> locusts, no bad, no curse on the ground. You could grow potatoes without having to bleed. You could uh, grow soybeans without having to sweat. And then that beautiful creation Remember in 2 Peter, it says, it, that world being overflowed with water perished. It perished. Yes? Is that like the first earth age? Yes. Where have you heard those words? Is it a uh, Schofield reference Bible? <laughs> I've heard that for a long Maybe. time. Maybe. Yeah, absolutely. There was the earth that then was the first earth age. And that one, being overflowed with water, perished. God drowned that earth out. And then, what we're about to see in the six days of creation, God makes the, new, uh, the earth that now is. And this one, he put a, a flood around the earth, but he didn't destroy the heavens like he did the first time. And then in the future, he's going to make the new earth. There are three ages of the earth throughout history. The earth that then was, the earth that now is, and the new earth. This is the earth that then was. You say, how long was Lucifer reigning on earth? I don't know. The answer might be in the Bible somewhere. I don't know. How long was... Is the earth millions and billions of years old? Maybe. I don't know. What I know is that since the creation of Genesis 1, the earth is only... 6,000 years old. I can tell you that without a doubt because the Bible gives you the exact timeline from Adam to Jesus Christ. Amen. That is exactly 4,034 years from Adam to Jesus. I can count out the timeline for you. If you let me walk you through the Old Testament, just give me a year to walk you through it. <laughs> when you read through some of the passages in Genesis, it'll say, this guy lived this many years and he had this kid. And then this kid lived this many years and he had this kid. And you go, why in the world are all these details? Well, if you pay attention and start writing it out, you'd realize from Adam all the way until Jesus, you have the amount of years. That's how we know for sure, without a doubt, that this earth that now is, is only 6,000 years old. Before that, I don't know. I don't know how long it was perfect. And then I don't know how long Lucifer reigned over it, and I don't know how long it was without form and void. What I do know is that God dumped that thing in water, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And darkness is always a judgment from God. Darkness is always bad. It is not good. No matter how much the world tells you dark is good, dark is bad. Men loved darkness uh, what does it say in John 3? Men would love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. You can get away with bad deeds in the dark. You can't in the light. So God puts darkness on the earth and he makes it without form and void. It's just nothingness. And that's where we'll continue on. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And remember I showed you what the deep is. God took the waters that were around that earth and he separated them. 
He divided them in the midst. And some of them he left down here on the earth. And some of them he put up in heaven. So if heaven's up here, God moved some of the waters to up there. And he left some of the waters down here on the earth. Right? So there's water here. Here's the earth. There's water here and there's water here. The space between. What did he call it? Nope. The firmament. This space is the firmament. Let me ask you a question. If you take water and you separate water from water, what's going to be in between those two? If you just... There's going to be nothing. There's not even going to be air. It's going to be a vacuum. Which, I don't trust science, but science says that the space is a vacuum. I halfway believe that, because if I took water and separated it out using some kind of a pump, right in the middle would be no air, it would be a vacuum. I don't know if that's the case in the heavens, but it would make sense. Right in this firmament, God put the sun, the moon, and the stars. And above the sun, moon, and stars is water, and that's called the deep. Does anybody remember what the face of the deep is like? Frozen. So it's ice on top, it's water in the middle, and what holds it up? Clouds. Clouds hold it up. So it's solid, liquid, gas. It is ice, then water, then steam, or vapor, clouds that hold it up out there. Then there's the firmament, and down here is you and me on the earth. Look it up, and we're like, what's out there? I don't know. <laughs> All I know is I see stars, I see a sun, I see a moon, and I see blackness. So why is there blackness? Because God clothed the heavens with blackness as a judgment for what Lucifer did. Otherwise, the whole universe should be light, because God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Here's where we are. As of, sorry, as of uh, Genesis 1-2, we're in a world with just water here. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and here's what we're about to get into. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So there's water covering the whole earth. No ground is exposed. And it's dark. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So what's the face of the water? On top. The top. The surface. So the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I looked at this and looked at this and looked at this and studied and studied and searched and searched and prayed and prayed. And I got a couple things about what that could be talking about, but in general, here's what I can tell you. I have no idea what the importance of that is. It is important, but I don't know what it is. Why did the Spirit of God move upon the face of the waters? I don't know. When did he move upon the face of the waters? I do not know. How? I don't know. Why? I don't know. When? What? I, I don't know. What I know is the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now that probably tells me this, that before he moved onto them, he wasn't there, which means God abandoned that little piece of the universe, probably. And that's why it was dark. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. Why? No God. He abandoned it. You ever heard that phrase, this God-forsaken place? Talk about God-forsaken, pitch black. Hell is not the absence of God. You always hear that. Hell is eternal separation from God. No, it's not. Hell is the eternal presence of God's wrath, and it's dark. Now, Jesus doesn't go walking around hell talking to his buddies. He doesn't go around there because it's a place of judgment, just like this was. It was dark, and he didn't go around there. Then... Someday, I don't know when, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And what happened? And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. What we're going to look at really quick is, since we're at this point in the scripture, what I want to do is while we go word by word through Genesis... I want to not leave anything unstudied. I want to hit these everything, and I don't want to assume that you know who the Spirit of God is, is what I'm getting at. I don't want to assume that you know who he is, what he does, where he lives, 
what he acts like, what he does. I want to show you from the Bible who the Spirit of God is. So, if you will, look with me. Try to find my place. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The Spirit of God shows up. It says, The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You can make a little section of notes right here and call it the Spirit of God, because we're going to talk about the Spirit of God here for a little bit. Who is the Spirit of God? Why does he show up? What kind of things does he do throughout the Bible? And there's no way I can cover the whole Bible's teaching on the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, but what I can do is give you a general idea. In the Old Testament, you can write these references down. Genesis, you don't need to turn there, write it down. Genesis 41, 38, the Spirit of God was in Joseph. That's what the Spirit of God was doing in Genesis 41, 38. He was in Joseph. Interesting. In 1 Samuel 10, 10, the Bible says the Spirit of God came upon Saul. And in a few other places. In 1 Samuel 19 20, 1 Samuel 19 20, he came upon the messengers of Saul. In 2 Chronicles 15, 1, it says he was upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And in 2 Chronicles 24, 20, the Bible says, it was upon Zechariah. So, so far in the Old Testament, we've seen the Spirit of God move upon the face of the waters, and we've seen him come upon several people Saul his messengers Zechariah Azariah he was in Joseph in the Old Testament the Holy Spirit did not dwell in people and own their bodies like he does with you and me the Holy Spirit would come on to somebody for God's purpose and then when God was finished with his purpose he would take the spirit off of them God did that with Saul there was a, a point when Saul decided to disobey, he quenched the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit departed from Saul. Something wonderful that you and I will learn is that in the church, the Holy Spirit not only comes upon you, he lives inside you, he dwells in you, he owns you, and he will never leave you, ever. The Holy Spirit of God will never depart. The Holy Spirit of God is God's down payment on your body. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of, our, of the uh, purchased possession. He's the earnest. You know what an earnest is? A down payment. When you want to buy a boat, you go in and you say, Hi, I'd like to buy this $60,000 boat. Yeah, I don't have that money either. I'd like to buy this $500 boat. <laughs> I have $100 now. Here's $100. Why are you giving $100 as a down payment? That is a promise that you are going to pay the rest, right? Here's $100, and later on, I will pay the rest and take what's mine. That is a down payment, an earnest. 
When God bought you, he gave a down payment, the Holy Spirit, and he put him inside you so that everyone around knows that is God's property. And in the future, he will fix it. <laughs> he will deal with it. <coughs> Your body and my body is still corrupt. We have back problems. We have neck problems. I have weird looking toenails. We have all kinds of weird stuff going on in our bodies. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> we have weird things going on. All those will be fixed. There will come a day when you don't have to worry about your physical problems ever again. The pain that you go through every day, it will be done forever. The sorrow, the tiredness, the tears, anything bad in your body, one day, if you're saved, will be done away. You know why? Because God will redeem this body. He's going to take your body and he's going to change it like unto his glorious body. He's going to give you a perfect body that you can enjoy for all of eternity. Thank God. That's wonderful. Amen. And his promise to you that he will do that is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is his down payment on your body. That's awesome. In the Old Testament, they did not have that. The church gets that very special gift. Nobody else gets it. It's awesome. Thank God for it. A part of the Old Testament doctrine is that they did not have eternal security like you and I have. The Holy Spirit could come off of them. He can never come off of you and me. I'll stop right there. What else was the Holy Spirit doing? In Job 33, verse 4, Elihu, a good guy, says that he created him. Job 33, 4. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, created Elihu. In Ezekiel, I've already forgotten the reference. In Ezekiel eleven twenty four. The Spirit of God transported Ezekiel in a vision. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16, Matthew 3, 16, the Bible says he descended like a dove and he lighted upon Jesus. The Holy Spirit of God is the least known member of the Godhead. If you go to anybody in the world, pick a random person on the street of New York City and say, who are the three parts of the Godhead? They'll probably tell you Father, Son, uh, or if they know it, if they know Father, Son, Holy Ghost, you'd say, tell me something about the Father. And they'd probably go, oh, he created all things. Tell me something about the Son. He died on the cross. Tell me something about the Spirit. Uh, people don't really know anything about the Spirit of God. Just right here, we haven't gotten into Christ's death yet. We haven't even gotten into the church. And the Holy Spirit of God was busy. Very busy. If he created Elihu, I would also imagine that he created you and me. The Holy Spirit is involved in creating people. The Holy Spirit of God moved upon people. The Holy Spirit of God moved people to speak the word of God. In the New Testament, it tells us that. That the scripture that we were given in old time was from the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit gave you this book. Which means he's important. People don't think about him too much. And Baptists especially, as Pastor has said several times, are scared of him, are scared of talking about the Holy Spirit because charismatics teach falsehood about the Holy Spirit. So anytime you say Holy Ghost, you're afraid maybe that somebody's going to think you're a charismatic or a Pentecostal or some false doctrine like that. When no, we just believe what the Bible says, that he's the third part of the Godhead and he stays busy. And he's in you and he's in me. And there are wonderful things that he does, like give us the Bible. He was doing all kinds of things in the Old Testament. He's also called the Holy Ghost. 
You can see that in Matthew 12, 28 to 32. That's where he's also called the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I hope you've got all that written down. What we're going to look at, and hopefully not take too much time, is in the church, for you and me, who is the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of God was busy back in Genesis. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Back then, when everything was a mess, the earth was without form and void, the Holy Spirit was doing something. He was busy working. He was moving upon the face of the waters. That was at least 6,000 years ago. And he's still busy today. The Spirit of God is busy in the church. He is constantly doing wonderful things for you and me. And I want you to see and write these down, if you can. In the church, here's what the Spirit of God does. In the Old Testament, he would come onto somebody and come off. Or he would put something in somebody's mouth, like he would tell a prophet, I want you to say these words. It was just kind of touch and go. You know what a touch and go is? In an airplane, here's a landing. And it stays on the ground. Here's a touch and go. The airplane touches, and then it takes off again. It doesn't stay on the ground. The Holy Spirit kind of did touch and goes in the Old Testament. It would touch, and it would leave. In the New Testament, it lands, and it breaks off its landing gear, so it never goes anywhere ever again. It stays around. Yeah. What does the Holy Spirit do for the church? First, Romans 15 and verse 19. The first thing, one of the first things he did for the church was he get empowered, he empowered the apostles. At the beginning of the church age, God appointed apostles. And those apostles could prove that they were from God because they were followed with signs and wonders. They could heal people, they could do miracles, they would show signs and wonders, marvelous, miraculous things like Remember when Saul got bit by a deadly snake and nothing happened to him? That was a miracle. And the people who saw it realized, you're a man of God because you just had a miracle happen. If you got bit in the throat by a copperhead and you just kind of threw it down and went, I'm fine, and went on about your day, you'd have a bad day. But if you got bit with a copperhead and nothing bad happened to you, people would go, uh, excuse me, what's going on there? You know, you should have died. What happened? It was a miracle. You should have... Something terrible should have happened to you. The Holy Spirit gave power to the apostles uh, back in early Acts. Next, here's what he does for you and me. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. And we'll put 1 Corinthians 3.16. These two verses. The Bible says that the Spirit of God dwells, <laughs> dwells in us. Romans 8, 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That tells me if you are saved, if you have believed on Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you, period. From the second you got saved, the Holy Spirit moved in. Now, why does that matter, Daniel? There are people in our city, in Robbins, who would call themselves Pentecostal. There's people all around Moore County. There's people all around North Carolina. There's people all around the United States called Pentecostals. What Pentecostals teach, or Charismatics, usually a Charismatic is Pentecostal, what they teach is that when you get saved, you believe on Jesus, and boom, you get saved. And then, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Some time has to pass, and it, they will say it some different ways. Sometimes they'll say, you received the full gospel. Or sometimes they'll say, you had a second act of the Holy Spirit come upon you. And they'll say, sometime after you got saved, when you finally give your whole life to the Lord, 
then the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you know how you know? You know how you know when the Spirit comes on you? You speak in tongues, or you get slain in the Spirit, or you get the unholy Parkinson's or whatever they have in church. <laughs> False teaching is what that is. You know why? Because there is no period of time after you get saved when the Holy Spirit of God is not in you. The second you got saved, right. he moved in. He not only moved in, he took the lease, he burned it, he made his own title, he owns you. You are not your own, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his, which are God's. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. Do you know what it means to dwell? Yep. I'm not going anywhere, I dwell here. This is my house. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. One of the best arguments I've ever heard for eternal or, uh, for assurance of salvation is this right here. If somebody asks you, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know how to know if I'm saved. Ask them this. If you had somebody move into your house and they were eating your food and they were drinking your water and they were going with you everywhere you went and they were using your bathroom and they were talking to your kids, and they were nudging you all day long, and they were sleeping in your bed. Do you think you'd know if they lived in you, in your house? You know? You'd know after about three seconds. So let me ask you this. If you've been saved about ten years, the Holy Spirit of God has been in you for about ten years. And he's been poking you all day long for ten years. And he's been trying to tell you things. And he's been convicting you. And he has been helping you. And he has been doing and doing and doing. And he's been doing it from inside you. And that never happened before you got saved. If you got saved, you should be able to tell. You don't, you don't not realize it if someone lives inside you. You know it. And if you don't know that you know that you know that the Holy Spirit has been working in you, either you're deceived and you're crazy or you're not saved. And I don't want to try to trick you into thinking you're not saved. What I want to show you is that if you're saved, you have God living in you. And if you're paying attention at all, you'll know. You will know. If you feel guilty right now, you probably know. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God is constantly at work inside you. It's a wonderful thing. He dwells in us. Romans chapter 8 verse 14 tells us that he leads us. He leads us like you lead a horse with a lead. Romans 8, 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Led by the Spirit. You know what led means? I wish Roger Lemons was here to show us. When you take a horse, what is that rope called that you pull a horse with? A lead. A lead. You know why? Because you are pulling that thing and showing it right where to go. The Holy Spirit of God, all day, every day, is trying to lead you. Some of us are stubborn donkeys. <laughs> For lack of a better... No, there's not a lack of a better word, so I don't say that word. <clears throat> Some of us are stubborn, and you should submit to his leading. I didn't write it down. That's why you asked. He leads us. Thank the Lord. If he didn't lead us, we wouldn't know where to go. Pop quiz, what does he lead us with? A lead, yes. What does the Holy Spirit lead us with? The word. The word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. <laughs> if you're paying attention to the Bible, you know what the next right step is. You know. You know what the next right step is. The Spirit is trying to lead you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. And Luke 2.26, we'll give a little extra stuff in there. Luke 2.26. The Bible says that he teaches us the things of God. Our very first class of Growing Grace, I told you, I'm not your teacher. Who is? Which part of the Godhead? 
The Holy Spirit. Who are we talking about right now? The Holy Spirit. So who is our teacher? The Holy Spirit. And who teaches us? And what does he use to teach us? The Word. The Word. The things of God are found in this book. The Holy Spirit wants to teach you using this book. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, I'll say he helps preaching. Whenever somebody gets up like I am right now and is teaching the Bible or preaching the Bible, like Pastor Will on Sunday morning, Lord willing, like thousands of pastors will around the world, when they get up, what they need to be doing is submitting to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, I'll read you that verse too. The Holy Spirit leads preachers. 99% of preachers don't follow, but the Holy Spirit tries. <laughs> the Bible says, Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So when someone gets up to preach Jesus Christ, guess whose help they need? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps in preaching. And uh, a good preacher will pray. If you're ever getting up, if you're a lady about to teach ladies, if you're a man about to teach anybody, if you're teaching children, you need to right away pray and ask for the Holy Spirit's help. And, you know, it sounds cliche. You've probably heard a preacher get up a thousand times and say, you know, pray that I'll be spirit-led when I preach. Pray that the Spirit will help me when I preach. We're not just breathing out hot air. We're asking God to actually help us. Because if I get up and just speak from my flesh, I will destroy lives. I will take away people's inheritance in eternity. I don't want to do that. What I want to do is get up and say what the Holy Spirit has for me to say, which most of the time is going to be quotations of Scripture. The Spirit of God helps in preaching. Next. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. Spirit of God seals us. The Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Remember that earnest I was telling you about, the down payment? The Holy Spirit is God's seal on you. You know what a seal is? Uh, here is... Oh, that's terrible. I don't drink much soda, but here's a soda bottle. And right here, it's going to have an emblem on it. And I'm going to see if you can recognize the emblem. It's just kind of a little... What's that? Pepsi. You know what that is? The seal of Pepsi. And I'm a terrible artist. It's probably, yeah. That is the seal of Pepsi. If you go into the Oval Office of the United States on the ground, you're going to see the seal of the President of the United States. That is a big stamp 